In this critique of this game, I'll be referring to Fallout quite a lot. I think there are many parallels to be drawn. When judging a game, it's helpful to compare it to a similar game. And by doing this, we can see what aspects of the game are superior or not, and how they stack up with the competition. Since Fallout is my favorite game series and it's similar to Stalker, I'll be using it. Now please don't take this as an attack upon the game, as though I'm trying to say that it's not as good as Fallout. I really like the Stalker series, but I must confess at times I had a very much love-hate relationship with it. There were times when I first started playing the games where I swore they were awful and didn't want to play them anymore. I'd start the game and after about two or three hours I'd call up a friend on Skype and complain that the game sucks. Really, I was just complaining that I didn't get the feel of the game mechanics right away, and that it was hard. Yes, I was being a whiner at first, but then I got the hang of the game. This was particularly so when I moved from Shadow of Chernobyl to Clear Sky. The new system for collecting anomalies was simply atrocious. However, I must admit that it was much more realistic. I'm not really sure how that works given that anomalies and artifacts don't really exist. I suppose it was just more along the lines of how I imagined it would be in real life. The Stalker's core achievement was to blend the history and method of first-person shooters with both the real world in the Chernobyl exclusion zone and with the Russian science fiction Stalker as a wider fictional concept came from the roadside picnic by influential Soviet science fiction writers the Stugartsky brothers. It was then later on built upon for the film by for the film Stalker by Andrei Tarkovsky. The themes of both the book and the film were unnatural happenings changing just a small part of the world and in doing so creating a zone in which the rules of nature were warped. The Ukrainians already had such a zone on hand in Chernobyl, and by merging Soviet fictions of the past with their own real history, they created a rich concoction of urban decay, supernaturalism, and gritty, grubby violence. That was the point of the games, wasn't it? To be as realistic as possible? The games were intended to force you to function with as little resources as possible. This is the way scavengers conduct business in real life, except they don't have to deal with anomalies killing them or transporting such things kilometers away. Sometimes I felt the game was too realistic. When it does, the game becomes hard. When that happens, the game becomes less fun to play. There always has to be some kind of balance between realism and playability. Shadow of Chernobyl was hard, but I found that Clear Sky was even more difficult. The question of difficulty was brought up by executive producer Dean Sharp in an interview with Imagine Games Network, or IGN. You know, it's a tough question, because there's a difference between really intelligent AI and fun AI. A lot of times really good AI just aren't fun. I think Stalker had a bit of that where the enemies were just too realistic, too intelligent. And it was just too hard and wasn't fun. So basically, I think there's a delicate balance between realism and fun. Well, I'd have to agree that the AI was really good at times, and in others it seemed to make no sense. There are moments when the enemy tries to flank you with the numbers, and in others it just stands out in the open. I particularly appreciate how enemies would take cover to reload weapons. I really appreciate that, especially when I forgot to do the same. I admit that there were times when I wanted to punch out the AI coders for the military when they were kicking my ass. It's at moments like these that you have to remind yourself that that is what Stalker is. You just have to pick yourself up by your Geiger counter, walk through another hail of bullets while injecting yourself with anti-radiation drugs while simultaneously reloading your gun which keeps jamming. The goddamn Obokan. Speaking of realistic, what was up with the goddamn Obokan? The atmosphere of Stalker is what really sets it apart from other survival and first-person shooting games. The creators went to great lengths to capture the feel of the post-Soviet Ukraine, the dilapidated buildings that remain as a testament to Soviet infrastructure programs that were abandoned after the fall of socialism. They add a good sense of collapse. The spacing of objects and their design give a good sense of desperation and survival. The ruined buildings, I think, were really well done. I've done some study in ruined buildings from my old Warhammer 40k city fight terrain making days. I'd be proud to replicate some of those buildings if I were still modeling. Abandoned and ruined Soviet buildings really add a sense of style to the whole area. You really do get the feeling that you've been left to your own devising. The arena of adventure sure does give the impression of being in a post-apocalyptic zone. This, I feel, we didn't get from Fallout New Vegas, which was more concerned with giving us a Western Frontier-style feeling. The music in Stalker, I think, was highly underrated. The people who did the music deserve a lot more recognition than they received. 
when it comes to my all-time this is BS moment in games, it must be chasing Straylock across the Chernobyl NPP. Nothing was more infuriating than chasing this guy with the monolith soldiers continually teleporting in your way. Not just any soldiers, exoskeleton wearing soldiers with near the best weapons possible. It was endless gauntlet running that was planned to make the game as hard as possible. This challenge was one of those rare occasions where I felt I couldn't do it. In other instances, I felt a section was too hard, but that I could do it. I don't think I actually did anything more difficult in any other games than this one challenge. I swear, man, sometimes you just want to, you know, just tear your hair out and punch your monitor. In Clear Sky, I felt you ran out of endurance way too quickly. In Shadow of Chernobyl, I thought the endurance system was way more appropriate. Most enjoyable was having artifacts that gave you an unlimited running time. I really missed this in Clear Sky. I was constantly overloaded with ammunition. By the time I was chasing Straylock, I had over 2,000 rounds for my AK. Even then, I still had a Tundra S14 with several hundred rounds of armor penetrating 9x39 caliber ammunition. On top of that, I still carried an SVU M2 sniper rifle with 25 rounds, so you could say I carried quite a load in terms of weapons. One thing I particularly despised was fighting at night. It wasn't bad in Shadow of Chernobyl, but it was hell in Clear Sky. Yes, I'm well aware this is how dark it is at night in a rural area. I've been camping many times. I know what it's like. However, I've never been looking for artifacts or getting shot at while doing it. I can't say much more than it was just too dark. The night vision goggles didn't really do much at all. Combine them with a head-mounted lamp and it still didn't make much of a difference. And perhaps I'm just being a little oversensitive on this one, but as Dean Sharp said, I think there's a delicate balance between realism and fun. More than once I found myself just letting my character just sit there until the sun came up, wasting huge amounts of time. I often found myself whining about not being able to move fast enough with my pack at full. It took me a while to accept that 50 kilos on your back is a lot of weight. That's 110 pounds. I don't think I could claim to do any better in real life. When I first got to the end of the game in Shadow of Chernobyl, I had a hell of a hard time. It was so frustratingly hard that I thought about quitting. Upon discussing things with a friend that introduced me to the game, did I realize the problem? I was using gear that was way too basic for the job. Here I was, stuck in a small room with high radiation facing down a pile of monolith soldiers in exoskeletons, and I was still wearing a stalker suit. And I was using an AK with regular rounds in them. Yes, I really should have upgraded before I made my way into the power plant, but I was also out of med kits and anti-radiation drugs. I was pretty screwed with little chance of reaching the end. I absolutely enjoyed walking around the outside of the power plant. After researching the Chernobyl accident so much, it made the experience much more fulfilling. The amount of detail that went into the architecture of the building during the coding is absolutely wonderful. My only lament is that I could not explore the outside of the building as much as I wanted to. The radiation was far too high. Climbing all over the outside of the building was very enjoyable despite the difficulty of the enemies. I greatly enjoyed the scenery. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it was one of those moments where you really marvel at how hard the programmers worked to get the detail right. I got a similar feeling walking into the strip in Fallout New Vegas for the first time. It's a hard feeling to describe. It's kind of like a running euphoria with a dash of awe. After researching the incident so much, it was powerful to actually get to walk around a life-sized model of it, even if it was only digital. It's hard to describe. I think it's one of those feelings that there are no words for, but one that everybody has felt at one time or another. I think researching the accident enhanced the experience of exploring a great deal. Having done so, I can really see the level of detail the creators went to in order to build an authentic experience. Something that sticks up my mind is seeing the leftover construction vehicles, which were too irradiated to retrieve. Trying to jump on them was part of exploring the level. I think perhaps my favorite part of this was walking along the roof of the building. I had learned so much about the bio-robots and their tremendous heroic efforts to clean the radioactive graphite off of it. The human body can withstand 500 rontogens in 5 hours. One of the bio-robots later recalled an interview of picking up pieces of graphite with his gloved hand that were 12,000 rontogens. During the game, I took a few moments to stand on the roof of the power plant, watching the radioactivity surge out of the roof of the sarcophagus. It gives the game a whole new meaning to understand the whole backstory behind what happened. 
I recommend researching it before playing the game if you really want a unique experience. This brings me to an infrequently talked about issue. The question of whether or not it is ethical to make a game about such a tragedy. Again, we return to executive producer Dean Sharp and his interview with IGN when he was asked the same question. Stalker is hugely popular in Russia and Ukraine, and you'd think if there was going to be a backlash, it would primarily be in those countries affected by Chernobyl, but there's none of that. Maybe because it's bringing to light something that happened or even putting a positive spin on it. From my standpoint, it's hard to say. I think it's a moral question I really can't answer. I really don't see any problem with doing so. I assume, of course, that someone somewhere is going to be offended by absolutely anything. I think the point made by Sharp pretty much says it all. The game does bring to light a very serious incident that took place. Well, the event certainly had a remarkable effect on Soviet politics. It certainly has a historical impact on the ethics of using nuclear power. Frankly, I don't think it's a big deal, but some environmentalists do. This is still being debated to this day, especially given the Fukushima disaster in 2011. Games like this have the possibility of stimulating interest in a historical event. It certainly did for me. I'm glad about that. I like learning new things. I've used the game in this, in this work to stimulate education on the subject, as I have with my previous work on Fallout. I think there really is room in the gaming world for educational work. As our society becomes increasingly alienated, we'll be increasing prescriptions for ADD and ADHD, rightfully so or not. These games can serve the purpose of being the sugar that helps the medicine go down. If we don't reform our failing education system, I don't see much harm in experimenting along these lines. This has always been my goal in writing these works. Returning to the game, I think it could have been longer, something much closer to that of the more recent Fallout games. Fallout seems to be a comparison in terms of gameplay, even though they came out after Stalker did. I think the game had the potential to have many more side missions and a much more in-depth and non-linear storyline, more akin to that of Fallout. With the different factions, I think there was the potential to navigate the hostilities between them creating those side missions. An easy route would be having to do a bunch of missions for a faction before they agreed to help you. This exists somewhat to a degree in Clear Sky, but I think this could have been done a lot more. The balance between a linear story and an open world was interesting in itself. Stalker's levels are interlinked, but not in themselves all that large. It never fully broke out into an open world, but was instead a sort of wider world. Rather than follow through sprawl, Shadow of Chernobyl spatially consisted in a series of discrete packages. Many of these feel like single first-person shooter levels on their own. Indeed, the game often treats them in that way, with scripted events dropping into your path on a regular basis. Attacks by the military, a careful ambush, attacks by mutants, battles between the various paramilitary factions, all these came together in a patchwork of events, between which you wandered, finding the safe path in your own way. The real shame is that the original creators of the game, GSC Game World, had intended it to be exponentially larger. The area in the game was intended to be almost 10 times larger than what was delivered to the public. GSC wanted to expand the world for the player to explore, but that was squashed by THQ for reasons that aren't entirely clear. Many game elements were removed from production for time and other concerns. Clear Sky was supposed to have drivable vehicles in it, even a radiation-proof armored personnel carrier and even a helicopter. That would have been pretty awesome. But this, along with many other features, were removed. This is a real good case of corporations destroying an artist's vision. Normally, I wouldn't really complain about something like this, but I do here because we missed out on so much. Not all hope is lost, though. Some fans banded together and created Stalker Lost Alpha. Basically, they took the original code, the abandoned parts of the game, and made them into one functioning whole. Yes, fans fixed the error for free that the corporation cut for profit. That massive open world that the game creators wanted to give the player is now available. The game is immensely longer, with much more missions to accomplish. Believe it or not, the game is actually harder. Yes, the, the game that's already too hard was made even more difficult. Despite that, we the fans of Stalker thank you, the people who went and put forward the effort to give us what we should have gotten. Even though there have only been three Stalker games, I 
still feel as though there should be more in the future. I think the game does have the capacity to expand into new storylines involving new characters. Perhaps a game could focus entirely on the development of a faction from its founding. Playing through the birth of duty or freedom would be quite entertaining. I think the Straylock storyline has gone its full course and needs to come to an end. Maybe there could be a prequel to the Mercenary Scar. I'd like to see something like that, and I think the fans would as well. No matter what happens, Stalker has a cult following, and rightfully so. This is an excellent game that I highly recommend to anyone who is interested in survival games that don't take the survival aspect too far. There has to be a nice balance between realism and fun. New Stalker games should include a hardcore mode, just as Fallout did. This way, someone could enjoy both sides of the game. I hope there are more games in the series in the future for a long time to come. Thankfully, they will be kept away from THQ now that they've gone bankrupt. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is a game by Ukrainian developer GSC Game World. It features an alternate reality theme in which a second disaster occurs at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 2006 and causes strange changes in the area around it. The game has a non-linear storyline and features gameplay elements such as trading and two-way communication with NPCs. The game also incorporates elements of role-playing games and business simulators. The background and some terminology of the game, Zone, Stalker, is borrowed from a popular science fiction novella, Roadside Picnic, by Arkanian Boris Dugartsky in the 1979 Andrei Tarkovsky film Stalker. It was loosely based on it, as well as Stalker, the film's subsequent novelization, which later became the full version of Roadside Picnic. In Shadow of Chernobyl, the player assumes the identity of the amnesiac stalker and the illegal explorer slash artifact scavenger in the zone, referred to as Marked One. The zone is a location of an alternate reality version of Chernobyl power plant after a second fictitious explosion that contaminated the surrounding area with radiation and caused strange otherworldly changes to the local flora and fauna as well as to the laws of physics. Stalker in its original film context meant explorer or guide as the Stalker's goal was to bring people into the zone. The acronym Stalker stands for Scavenger, Trespasser, Adventurer, Loner, Killer, Explorer, Robber. On the 11th of July 2007, GSC Game World announced a prequel, Stalker Clear Sky, which was released on the 5th of September 2008. On April 30th, 2009, GSC Game World announced a sequel, Stalker Call of Pripyat, which was released worldwide in February 2010. In the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster, the Soviet Union designated an area around Chernobyl as an exclusion zone, often referred to in-game as the zone for special research into the human mind. Results include enhanced ESP, psychic weapons, and the eventual formation of a hive mind known as the Sea Consciousness. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the self-aware Sea Consciousness takes control of the zone and autonomously continues its research. It attempts several times to bring about world peace using global mind control. However, these attempts result in the unintentional twisting of the physical terrain around Chernobyl, as well as the mutation of resident life forms. In an attempt to hide its existence from the outside world, the sea consciousness erects a monolith in the center of the zone, which it uses to brainwash any stalkers lucky enough to reach it into serving the sea consciousness. In a further attempt to insulate itself, it constructs a network of psi fields, known as the Brain Scorcher, that effectively destroys the mind of anyone it gets too close. As reports of valuable artifacts disseminate from explorers who venture into the zone, whispered rumors of a wish granter housed in the sarcophagus of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant begin to spread. A group of four stalkers named Straylock, Ghost, Fang, and Doctor travel to the center of the zone in an effort to uncover its secrets. They attempt to unlock a particular door inside the sarcophagus, but their attempts failed after encountering a large number of the fanatical monolith faction. They are then forced to retreat. Straylock is knocked unconscious during any mission or blowout and is badly injured. But Ghost and Fang manage to keep Straylock alive and seek cover from the blowout. Straylock is taken to Doctor, who treats him for his injuries while Ghost and Fang seek to find a way to open the door. However, Straylock goes to the sarcophagus on his own and is caught in a powerful em emission and knocked out and suffers from memory loss. The others, unaware of Straylock's fate, try to find out where he is, although Fang is later killed by a mercenary and Ghost is killed by overwhelming psychic emissions 
from a mutant known as a controller, which is on the job for the ecologist. The unconscious Straylock is discovered by the Sea Consciousness, who, unaware of his own identity, mistakenly assigns him the task of killing the stalker known as Straylock and his allies. On the way out of the zone, the truck carrying the unconscious Straylock is destroyed, and he is discovered by another passing stalker. Later in the game, Straylock is reunited with Doctor, who helps him piece together his past, prompting Straylock to return to the Chernobyl NPV and the Monolith. When Straylock eventually confronts the Sea Consciousness, he is faced with the choice of merging with it and attempting to repair the zone and bring about world peace, or trying to stop the Sea Consciousness from continuing his experiments. If the player chooses not to join the Sea Consciousness, he is forced to battle the heavily armed members of the Monolith faction. When they are defeated, he destroys the bodies that make up the Sea Consciousness. Straylock is then seen standing in a grassy field, the zone seemingly gone. In 2011, a lone stalker named Straylock and his group found a way through the center of the zone and came very close to entering the laboratory that housed the operations for the center of the sea consciousness. Straylock's team was stopped, however, and the group fell, fell apart. Straylock himself tried to return to the sarcophagus using a prototype side protection device given to him by Sakharov that rendered him invulnerable to the brain scorcher's emissions. However, he was interrupted at the nuclear power plant by the Clear Sky faction and their ally Scar, who attempted to use the prototype EM-1 rifle to disable Strylock's psi protection. After the Sea Consciousness unleashed a powerful mission that resulted in Clear Sky's downfall, an unconscious Strylock was then captured by the Sea Consciousness and brainwashed to become an agent. Because of the fault in the Sea Consciousness systems and Strylock's own total amnesia, he was given the mission to kill himself in order to prevent further incursions into the heart of the zone. Straylock, suffering from amnesia, confused and barely alive after falling off of the death truck, woke up in Sidorovich's bunker in the cordon not long after having been sent back into the zone to carry out his strange mission. From there he embarked on a journey that took him farther and farther north. Gathering fragments of truth one by one, as if they were pieces of a puzzle, he raided old facilities, shut down the psi emitters, and eventually eliminated the brain scorcher itself. Straylock finally found himself back at the nuclear plant with most of his memory restored. He ultimately learns from his friend Doc that he is Straylock. After recovering Fang's own decoder and using it to open the monolith control center, Straylock discovers that the wish grantor itself is effectively a flytrap. After seemingly destroying the monolith, the Sea Consciousness hologram appears in the room and answers Straylock's question, who are they? How the project was born? What happened to Straylock? The Sea Consciousness then offers Straylock to join the group, to join the project to stop the zone from expanding. He, however, refuses and is then teleported to the outside of the lab. After going through the teleport anomalies and the monolith's finest expert, Straylock arrives in the room that hosts the life support pods of the Sea Consciousness members. Using his AKM 742U, Straylock proceeds to shoot the pods, destroying the Sea Consciousness. However, this fails to undo the damage done by the Sea Consciousness as the zone becomes more unstable and emissions grew more frequent, as evidenced in Stalker Call of Pripyat. The Nosphere, according to the thought of Vladimir Vernadsky uh, and uh, Talihar Chardin, denotes the sphere of human thought. The word is derived from the Greek word for mind and sphere, in lexical anthology to atmosphere or biosphere. In relation to the Stalker game, scientific experiments done on the Nosphere form the zone. In the original theory, Vernadsky the, the Nosphere is the third in a succession of phases of development of the Earth after the Geosphere, inanimate matter, and the Biosphere, biological life. Just as the emergence of life fundamentally transformed the Geosphere, the emergence of human cognition fundamentally transforms the Biosphere. For Dillard, and the Nosphere emerges through and is constituted by the interaction of human minds. The Nosphere has grown in step with the organization of the human mass in relation to itself as it populates the earth. As mankind organizes itself in more complex social networks, the higher the noosphere will grow in awareness. In Stalker game series, the theories of the noosphere is altered slightly. Rather than a more or less abstract social slash environmental concept, 
The noosphere is very much real, a tangible, if invisible, field surrounding the Earth, linked by, affected by, and affecting human minds and thoughts. After the 1986 incident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, a series of secret laboratories were created within a 30-kilometer exclusion zone around the Chernobyl NPP. Nosphere was one of the main research areas the scientists concluded that it was indeed real and could be tampered with, removing negative emotions such as anger, cruelty, greed, etc. entirely from the planet. However, a single human could not affect the Nosphere in any noticeable way. Thus, it led to the creation of the Sea Consciousness. In 2006, when Sea Consciousness attempted to alter the Nosphere, the experiment backfired horribly. The result was the Zone. Since then, the Sea Consciousness has been fighting against the Zone with little success, mostly by attempts to contain it. In one of the endings of Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, it is suggested that destroying the Sea Consciousness also resulted in the destruction of the Zone. However, in Call of Pripyat, it is revealed that the zone is still very much active, and the damage to the noosphere is likely permanent. I cannot claim to know what the makers of the game were intending with its production. Were they trying to make a point about our social consciousness with it? Was this a way of a former USSR country trying to criticize the Marxist idea of human nature and its relation to material conditions? Who knows? But I think the creators were probably just out to make some money by telling a story. So I do not claim to know what GSC Game World was intending in terms of philosophy or subtext. I don't claim to speak for them either. What I'm trying to do is look into the story and its meaning from my own Marxist perspective. I see the noosphere as an analogy for social consciousness. We all collectively make up a particular consciousness or human nature. That human nature is really the aggregate of our interactions and our re reactions to those interactions with each other. There is no one monolithic, pun intended, human nature that rules over us all. There are some aspects which remain locked in as truth. In general, in overall sense, there is no real human nature to speak of. Our actions, opinions, and certainly our interactions collectively make up what is known as human nature at any given point. Marxist theory and bourgeois theory stand in stark contrast to each other. While Marxists contend that human nature is socially constructed, the bourgeois theory is that it is set in stone and that the vast majority of the aspects of it cannot be challenged. We Marxists see that as something of our social real, some, something fluid, which changes according to the conditions in which it exists. It is a product of our social relations. The bourgeois claims that it is set in stone and that people by their very nature are bad. They will choose to do bad because that's just the way we are. LOL Determinism. Such a position looked at critically shows us that it is nonsense. Human nature has changed over time as people have changed over time. As we pass through various stages in the development of human society, we see it change. Could we say that we are now a society as it was the same when we were Neanderthals? Certainly not. In history, we have seen people live in tribal societies in relative peace. In these societies, people live in a totally collective way. Each member contributes his or her own labor to the social product that the tribe requires in order to survive. Via this mode of production, everyone is explicitly socially linked by exchanging the products of their labor. By doing so, they see each other as a part of a collective that works together for a common survival. At other times, we have seen human societies that thrive off and actively seek out violence. During the Roman Empire alone, there was a great transition from pure athletic competitions as entertainment to the barbarity of throwing Christians to the lions and having gladiator contests. During the feudal era, it was understood that human nature was to be totally subservient to God and the corresponding power structure on earth. In feudalism, land is owned by a lord or a king. The people who work that land, which produces the social product, is tied to that land quite physically. They work the majority of the week to supply the lord with his excess, while the rest of the week is spent on their own reproduction. With this society comes a social structure which perpetrates it. God demands that the peasants be tied to that land in servitude. As a result, we have a class divide between owners and producers. Today, we have all manner of theories about the rejection of these human nature ideas, anywhere from agnostic to total atheist. The only thing about human nature that hasn't changed is the fact that it's always changing. In the game story, the noosphere takes on a physical form as opposed to the original concept theorized by Vladimir Varansky and Hjallar and Chardin. From this, I think it's safe to look at it as an analogy for human nature. 
we're told very little of the background of the experiments. This is, of course, deliberate as the your character is supposed to have amnesia, and information is supposed to be unlocked as you proceed through the game. When looking at the game, I think the seed consciousness is supposed to represent the conscious recognition that human nature, or no-sphere, is bad and must be changed. This is one of the particular developments of Marxist theory, historical materialism. In it, Marx theorized that it was the material conditions of man which were the determining factor of their social interactions, and thus, human nature. The first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of human individuals. Thus, the first fact to be established is the physical organization of these individuals and their consequent relation to the rest of nature. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. To understand history from a materialist standpoint, we must first acknowledge the uniqueness of man from animal. We have the ability to think. We have consciousness. This allows us to be able to take on different forms of social organization, which animals and or other organisms without consciousness cannot. It's because of this consciousness that we fully interact with our environment and alter it, as opposed to being dominated by it by, like animals are. Even ancient tribal societies were made subject to the whims of nature for the most part. We achieve this disconnection from nature that animals are not capable of by creating means of production, or more specifically, creating our own means of subsistence. Animals rely on the environment to provide for them with all their means of subsistence, food, shelter, etc. Human beings, on the other hand, have developed a way to produce their means of subsistence outside of nature. For example, we can create gardens, we can engage in blacksmithing, we can develop ways of producing what we need outside of the whims of nature itself. As human beings, we can begin to control our own destiny by creating our own means of subsistence, as opposed to being made subject to nature as hunter-gatherers were. What we are producing in the creation of our own means of subsistence is the organization of our own means of production. This organization of the productive forces creates the social forces that we have with each other. In the various modes of production throughout history, we have a corresponding set of social relations that go along with it. The organization of production in feudalism gives rise to the feudal social organization of society, kings, lords, serfs, peasants. The organization of production in capitalism gives rise to the capitalist social organization of society, capitalists and workers. These social organizations are what determine how we see the world, how we see the world around us in our relationship to each other. It creates the conditions for our human nature at that time. Our material conditions create our interactions with each other that, in the aggregate, make up what human nature is. Or, to put it another way, the materialist conception of history starts from the proposition that the production of the means to support human life and, next to production, the exchange of things produced is the basis of all social structure, that in every society that has appeared in history, the manner in which wealth is distributed and society divided into classes or orders is dependent upon what is produced, how it is produced, and how the products are exchanged. From this point of view, the final causes of all social changes and political revolutions are to be sought. Not in men's brains, not in men's better insights into eternal truth or justice, but in changes in the modes of production and exchange. According to the historical materialist theory, the changes in society come about not because someone has an idea of how to better organize society. It comes about as a result of the organization or evolution of production. In the course of human history, people develop the means of producing our means of subsistence that produce more than we needed for survival. In other words, for the first time, a surplus was created. Once the means of production created the surplus, there became a struggle over who owned that surplus. The creation of the idea of ownership of the surplus gave rise to the idea of private property. The advent of private property gave rise to new social organizations based upon private production and ownership of the social product. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence depends, first of all, on the nature of the actual means they find in existence and have to reproduce. This mode of production must not be considered simply as the reproduction of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is the definite form of activity these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. 
what they are therefore coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. The nature of individuals thus de depends on the material conditions determining their production. This recognition of how history evolves gives rise to the understanding of base and superstructure. The base is understood as our mode of production. That mode of production becomes the material conditions that create the social relations that we have with each other. We know these ideas as family, religion, distribution of wealth, government, and class structure. These relations are what, in the aggregate, make up what human nature is at any given time. Human nature is contingent upon our social relations, are, which are determined by our productive relations. The no-sphere and stalker is seen as a physical representation of the human nature, or the end result of the collective consciousness of the whole of humanity. In the game, it acts as a rejection of this materialist concept of history. In fact, it is the opposite of what Marx and Engels theorized. It mostly conforms to the bourgeois view of human nature. In Marx's theory, we see human nature as an accumulation of our interactions that make it up. In the bourgeois view, it is something solid and concrete, as represented by the no-sphere being a physical entity that is static, but, however, is theoretically susceptible to manipulation. This idea of a static human nature being manipulatable does correspond to bourgeois theory, and it is not a contradiction as it may appear. The bourgeoisie manipulated all the time, even if they refuse to recognize it. Their view maintains that human beings are inherently greedy, therefore acting greedy is a justification for capitalism as a system which thrives on and perpetuates greed. Yet whenever someone does something greedy like steal or cheat on their taxes, engage in a hostile corporate takeover, manipulate the government into getting no-bid contracts, or remain on welfare refusing to get a job, they complain that someone was acting greedy or unethical. These actions are all the result of greed. Those who support this view simply don't count these actions as a part of the of greed or the virtue of selfishness. It's completely logically inconsistent and terribly hypocritical. To them, greed and self-interest is a good thing until it has a negative effect on them. They also make the assumption that greed is good because it fulfills wants which are somehow, according to them, inherent in every person. Of course, in reality, nearly all material wants are entirely socially determined. People didn't inherently want for video games when they did not exist. Want for 99% of consumer commodities is artificially created via advertising and socially constructed social values. Advertising firms and marketing departments are known for keeping psychologists on the payroll for advice in the planning of how to make advertisements manipulating people into wanting things. That's right, these wants in capitalism don't exist without psychological manipulation. Advertising evolved from simply letting us know a product is available to the necessity of consumer manipulation. Yet, those who support capitalism would have us believe that wants just exist independent of social forces, and that these wants justify the capitalist system as a means of fulfilling those wants. I think it's appropriate the way the no sphere is depicted in the game. It's a static, real, material thing that people attempt to manipulate because it doesn't 100% conform to what it is they want, even though they claim it is. The fact it is a physical thing in the game adequately reflects the hyper-materialist, as opposed to idealist or dialectical, standpoint from which capitalist philosophy is based.